few years ago, and I think this is important, during COVID and everything that that entailed, those two years of, of craziness, of high stress, high tension, society that was tearing itself apart, lockdown, social, iso social isolation, stress levels were way up, anxiety levels were way up, but I was getting these emails from young men asking about something uh, called hard flaccid, and I had never heard of it, so I had to look it up. And I asked some other PRI therapists about it, and they had never heard of it either. So, you know, you can look it up and see what the symptoms are. My guess was that, and people were saying, well, how does a PEC pattern or a patho PEC pattern, or how could posture restoration help with, with these issues? So, you know, my guess is that it's not something new. It, 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 it's probably still the underlying issue is one of tension and anxiety and increased levels of tension that never get down, that never come down. So you're living in a state where it makes, it kind of makes your sexual reproductive cycle system go a little bit haywire. So my guess is that it was just like traditional erectile dysfunction. It's mostly would be uh, created by stressful situations and just a world that had been dominated by, I haven't, interestingly, I haven't had anyone reach out about that particular issue to me since COVID was kind of over, you know. So to really understand this topic, I would highly recommend that you read this book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers uh, by Robert Sapolsky. Amazing author. He's funny. He's a neuroscientist. He studies primates or that used to, he used to study primates. And he, this book is all about uh, how the body copes with stress and increased levels of stress that never decrease. And that's really what we're talking about here with a PEC or a patho PEC. These are individuals whose tension levels never come down. So this is what the author says about getting erections. Getting an erection to work properly is so incredibly complicated physi physiologically that it, if men ever actually had to understand it, none of us would be here. Fortunately, it runs automatically, or it should run automatically. In order for a male to have an erection, his parasympathetic nervous system must be turned on. Now, that's the crux of the issue. People who are stuck in a PEC pattern or a patho-PEC pattern, their parasympathetic nervous system activity is depressed and their sympathetic fight-or-flight response is elevated. He goes on to say, thus, stress will knock out male sexual response quite readily. In general, the problems with the erections are more disruptive than problems with testosterone secretion. So the erectile issue, the erectile dysfunction issue is rarely a, uh, a testosterone issue because even little boys before their hip puberty, they get erections. Uh, I don't think I was precocious in any way that I had erections before. I was a teenager, so even in the absence of a lot of testosterone, erections still are not difficult to obtain. Uh, so really, the bigger issue is going to be psychological or physical stress. So here's a little chart. Uh, on this side, which I'm gonna say the right side of the body is more sympathetic nervous system dominant. The left side is more parasympathetic nervous system dominant. And here's the, the issue that when a human or a man will more likely encounter erectile dysfunction issues when they are not parasympathetic enough. They are too sympathetic. So if this sympathetic nervous system can't tone down, if it can't decrease, you're less likely to, to live in a parasympathetic state and you're less likely to achieve erections. Now, the, the funny thing is, I don't know if it's funny or not, but so another issue would be premature ejaculation. Ejaculation is a sympathetic nervous system issue. And this is where the interplay between the two, it's almost cruel and comical at the same time. Here you are needing to be parasympathetic, completely rested to get the erection to begin with. But then as you're engaging in sexual activity, your heart rate goes up, your breathing goes up. This is all sympathetic nervous system activity. So here you are needing parasympathetic resting state to achieve the erection and then you're trying to hold on, hold on, hold on. And all the while you're becoming more sympathetic, sympathetic, sympathetic. And then eventually 
you cross over that line and there you go. Uh, and that's the end of it. So it's this, it's this uh, you're trying to hold on as long as possible in one area of your body to that, to that parasympathetic state while your heart rate goes up, your breathing goes up, but where it counts, you're still trying to remain, you know, parasympathetic. Maybe that's why you start thinking about baseball or deep breathing, whatever it's gonna be, is to keep your parasympathetic state still going in that, in that particular region. But eventually, everything switches over to sympathetic and ejaculation. So specifically, what they would want to know was pelvic floor. Maybe pelvic floor pain is associated with this particular issue, but what they wanted to know, I believe, was how can the pelvic floor influence what they were experiencing. Now, I don't know because I, I again, I don't know what the, I don't know what the issue was overall, except probably tension. But the pelvic floor, if the pelvis is forward on one side, or both, the bottom of the pelvis will squeeze like this. And then the, the diaphragms, the, not the diaphragms, well, the pelvic floor diaphragms, the pelvic floor muscles will get bulge and they'll get, you know, they can get very tight and static. And they're not, they're no longer, when you take a breath in, when you take a breath in, the pelvic floor muscle should descend. And when you exhale, they should go up. So they work with the, with the respiratory diaphragms. When the diaphragm, the left, so when the respiratory diaphragm, in, when you inhale, the respiratory diaphragm goes down the pelvic floor muscle should go down, and then when you exhale, they should go back up. And they need to work as a team. But when your pelvis is forward on one or both sides, and those pelvic floor muscles are not positioned properly, they lose their ability to coordinate with the, with the respiratory diaphragms. So the coordination between the di respiratory diaphragm, which is inside the rib cage, and the pelvic floor diaphragm, which is inside the pelvis, that, that coordination gets lost. So you're no longer diaphragmatically breathing. So what are you gonna be? You're gonna be a neck breather and a lower back breather. So right there, once that, ish, once that dynamic is established, you are more likely, well you will, be on this side of things. You're gonna be too sympathetic nervous system dominant. You're too fight or flighty because you're not, you're not diaphragmatically breathing. You're gonna be a neck breather. Now here's the other issues. The longer that goes on, that you're either in a left AIC or a PEC pattern, your femurs are going to have to rotate in the wrong, into the wrong position so that, you can remain, so that you can maintain straight. The longer you're in that position, these femurs and these hips are going to become less stable. So as instability builds through the pelvis, you're probably going to have to tighten up the pelvic floor more and the lower back muscles and the hip flexors and then back to your neck again. All these areas, these extension muscles are going to become even tighter, which is going to make you breathe with your neck even more, which is going to make you even more sympathetic dominant. So instability from the, from the pelvis and then your brain's going to stop recognizing the ground appropriately. I talk about this in all these, uh, all these videos, uh, ground recognition, sensing the ground. Once you become too unstable through your pelvis and through too tight through your back and your neck, it's going to unground you. Every breath you take is going to pull you away from the ground because you're neck breathing. So your brain will, in a very real sense, will lose sense of the ground. And that just further puts you into sympathetic nervous system function. And a sympathetic nervous system function that will not switch over to parasympathetic is a system that cannot rest. It is a stressed out anxiety ridden system and now it affects your thoughts and your behaviors in your life which now you ruminate on these issues that you can't resolve this tension this pain this pelvic floor issue and again you're more you're less likely at that point to achieve normal erections because you can never get into a parasympathetic nervous system state so how would one get out of this sympathetic state this pec or patho pec state well abdominals have to integrate the thorax with the pelvis. So a lot of typical positions are the all fours position, hands and knees position, standing wall supported reaches and 90-90 position. These are all standard PRI techniques. So if you're doing a PRI program, you'll probably have experienced at least one of them. You can find them on different channels. I have a couple on my channel, but you need to be able to, remember you're in a state of extension on one or both sides. You, got, you have to learn how to get back into a state of flexion and learn how to breathe in that position so your body can expand and stop extending when you breathe. 
you have to stabilize the pelvis, you have to sense the ground, probably get a better pair of shoes, all that type of stuff. It's, that is basic PRI 101. Uh, so that's really the, and the stable, and get that pelvis stable. And once you can adduct and abduct and feel your adductors and feel your hamstrings and feel your abs and feel your glutes in PRI techniques, at that point, the pelvic floor is probably no longer the issue. If you're experiencing issues at that point and your tension levels have dropped, there's a distinct, distinct possibility that you're still, it's become performance anxiety. That's what's gonna happen. And that anxiety, it's the emotion attached to the incident. So let's say you've, ne it's never, you've never experienced you know, erectile dysfunction before. The first time it happened, and it happens to pretty much all men at some point in their lives, the first time it happens, and like, one of two things is gonna happen in your mind. Like, oh, that's kind of weird. That sucks. And move on. Or you're gonna be like, what the hell just happened? Oh my God, oh my God. And you're gonna freak out about it. And the more emotion you attach to that incident of erectile dysfunction, the more likely it's gonna recur because you're learning to fear the act of sex or anything that involves or needs an erection. So that would be sex. So anytime you get into that sexual dynamic, you're going to remember because of the emotional, the negative emotions attached to the incident, your brain will get short-circuited, your fight or flight system will kick into gear. I just wanna read about the amygdala and how that works. It's a learned fear behavior. And once that becomes automatic, once that, once the trauma of the incident has become too great, maybe the first time it won't bother, maybe not the first time's like, ah, whatever. But if it happens again and again, now every time you get into that situation, you're gonna fear it. You're gonna fear it happening and it's gonna happen. It becomes anxiety, it's performance anxiety. And it's not an intellectual issue at that point. It's a uh, below the cortex level. You can think about it in a lot of different ways. You can think, hey, it's not the end of the world. Uh, it happens to everyone. But it's not gonna make a ton of difference if that sympathetic nervous system still has this learned fear. And you know, because again, the more negative emotional attachment or the more negative emotion that's attached to the incident, the more likely it will be uh, to happen again. So the only way out of it is, well, make sure you have an understanding partner, and that's not always easy. Uh, if they think it's the end of the world, or if you think it's the end of the world, well, then it becomes the end of the world. But if neither person thinks it's a big deal, it's just a normal part of life that every single person, every single man will at some point uh, experience, well, that's just part of life, and it's not a big deal. But if you make it into a big deal or the partner makes it into a big deal or you make it into a big deal because they think it's about them or you think there's something seriously wrong with you, the tension levels go up. And remember, we don't ex just because we have a thin layer of skin doesn't, doesn't insulate us from the feelings of other people. If that other individual is getting all worked up about it, it's gonna influence you and how you feel about the situation, like shame, worry, embarrassment, whatever it's gonna be. And those negative emotions associated with the incident will condition the amygdala, condition your fear responses so that the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight system kicks in when you need to be parasympathetic and now nothing works and you get stuck in this, in this cycle. So at that point, it is a psychological issue. It's not really physical. Uh, you just have to learn psychologically how to let things occur again. Uh, and that may, well, that's why these counselors and these doctors, uh, that's why they exist and you may need help with it.